presentation uh, after the break is uh, given by uh, Eugene uh, de Villiers. Um, he's owner of the company Engis, uh, located in, uh, in London. Uh, the company has uh, developed uh, uh, an improved version of uh, uh, an improved CFD version based on open phone technology, uh, incorporating a native uh, graphical user interface. And he will uh, uh, present the capabilities uh, using an example of an, uh, a butterfly valve. Thanks, Frank. Um, okay, so like Frank said, uh, the, the main focus of, of this presentation really is on um, the, the capabilities we've developed. But in the context of oil and gas, we're going to look at an example, which is a actuated butterfly valve. So I'm just going to use that to illustrate some examples as I go along. Right, so um, we'll uh, look at the problem first. So we've got a, a valve, simple valve closing, butterfly valve closing, um, and we're interested in the dynamic force on the valve during motion. So as it closes or opens, we want to see how that compares to static analysis, basically. So there are many experiments and st um, static CFD calculations where the valve is open in specific situations uh, or degrees, and we want to see how that compares to the valve in motion. Um, this is because uh, there was an initial investigation using static analysis to see whether the forces on the valve could contribute to issues with the actuator where the valve got stuck. Um, there were no issues with the steady state, so they decided it was not the, the flow-induced problems, but we want to see whether um, dynamic aspects can impact that. So what we use that case for is demonstrating the sl sliding interface capability in open foam. So if you don't know open foam, it's an open source CFD code. It's very widely used, it's got some fantastic capability, but it's very difficult to use. Um, so we, we have added some components there to open foam. Uh, first is to, to put a GUI there, a front end, that allows you to set up the case by clicking buttons instead of editing you know, dozens of files. Um, but also, we find that in open foam, there is a measure that we help develop, and it's a, it's a very powerful measure, but it's not very precise. So when you do something like a sliding, a closing valve, you have to be very precise uh, meshing uh, that, that merges very carefully at the point where the motion of the two grids is happening. So I'll show you a lot about that as well that we've um, uh, enhanced and developed further. So just quickly one slide about Endis. Um, we're, we're headquartered in London. Um, we've got offices throughout the world and we focus on CAE um, services and products um, but primarily on open source um, tools. So. Uh, open Foam, uh, we've been working with, I've been working with personally since before with Open Foam at Imperial College. Um, but also the code is an optimization tool, there are some morphing tools like Blender, um, post processing tools, and then more, more recently um, we've added uh, our own GUI Helix to the mix. Um, we have collaborations uh, with uh, various companies around the world, and we've recently started a collaboration with Dynaflow in the oil and gas market, specifically around Helix and the added value that we bring to the open source package. Right, so there, there are two versions of our GUI. One is open source, completely free. You can download it from SourceForge, or you can put it on a, Helix, oh, sorry, on a Linux machine, and it will just run. Um, this is the front end for, uh, for standard open foam. It can read standard open foam setup files, and it will output standard open foam configuration files. So you can take your existing cases, download this thing, load them up, and you can see them, manipulate them, and do different things to them. <coughs> um, at the moment, it's just single phase, and um, compressible, incompressible flows, but we're actively developing. We want this thing, want this tool to be a standard interface for open foam, able to do a wide range of applications in CFD and open foam. Um, it's early days yet, but we've had about uh, nearly 5,000 downloads since, since we first released it, and the first release was really buggy, but it's coming along, it's uh, quite stable now, although the, the number of applications is still limited, it is growing and it is improving every day. Then we have um, a pro tool, if you want to call it that, uh, Helix without the OS. And this is um, not just a, a GUI, but it's a combination of a GUI, um, our extended version of open phones, adding better meshing capabilities, better, better solvers, um, and bundling it in a support package with uh, the GUI. Uh, we've added many, many uh, improvements to open phone. Sometimes we have more, sometimes we have less as the standard version upgrades. But our, our, probably our primary uh, focus and activity development is improving the mesh. Um, we also have better solvers or different solvers, um, 50 different additional boundary conditions, 
Um, we have a, a case setup tool that's a batch mode of uh, the helix that allows you to do uh, DOEs and optimization. <coughs> and we've also incorporated a lot of the open source add-on modules like um, Swiss Army Knife for phone, which is just a toolkit for doing all kinds of uh, uh, manipulation of boundaries and initial fields. And we also have ways, of, uh, ways to phone for offshore wave generation impacting on structures and breakwaters and ships, etc. Um, along with all this, we have a validation program. We have a lot of test cases, and they're specifically tied to our customers. So if a customer is in HVAC or building or, or shipbuilding, we, we tend to try to absorb some of their knowledge into the code, <coughs> and we, we create um, validation cases which we then run. Every time there's an upgrade or a change, we make sure that we're not breaking um, critical systems for the customer. We also have a user guide, um, about three, 400 pages now and counting. So that's also something unique to our version. Um, and we have several clients already using this, but uh, like I said, it's early days, and we hope that this will um, increase uh, a lot. Certainly, the number of downloads of Helix OS indicate there's more interest than, uh, than we have tapped so far. Um, right, so starting with the case with a butterfly valve, OpenFoam has got very good, very good support for dynamic meshes. So you can slide meshes, you can, you can move objects around, you can roll them. Um, it's got an arbitrary interface, arbitrary mesh interface like a GGI and Fluent, so you can couple two dissimilar meshes or you can rotate or slide along that interface. Um, but that, that interface is very sensitive to the quality. So if there's a little bit of overlap and extra cell doesn't match, it'll just fall over. So that puts a, a big um, onus on the mesh generator to provide a very accurate uh, interface between the two sites in terms of its integral space that occupies. <coughs> also, with something like a valve, feature edges and shading around the sharp corners are very <coughs> important, and these haven't always been very well captured in standard open foam. Um, that's uh, the topic of the next few slides, is uh, just to compare the standard measure. Now, the recently a new version of OpenFoam was, rele was released 2.2, where they made a lot of improvements to the mesh generator. Prior to this, we were a lot, lot better. The meshing now, we're still better, but not as much better. Um, we have a list here of the different things that uh, we can do and stand up for can do. I think some of the, the, the important ones here is the feature line. Um, in open phone currently, you have to specify the feature lines via separate inputs. So you create this separate file, and you tell the measure this is where the feature lines are. In our version, um, you don't have to put any feature lines. If they are there, they can be extracted. And even if the, the feature lines are between different intersecting geometries, we have an implicit way of capturing feature lines. So the measure will find those, even if there is no actual feature in the geometry that you put into the, to the system. We also provide multi-region support. So you can, you can mesh conjugate e-transfer. You can mesh everything at once. You don't have to go and mesh every single bit and then bring them together afterwards. Um, the other thing that's important, um, scaling for very large cases, 200 cores, 500 cores, the measure, the standard measure scales about 60 cores, and then it starts to decrease in performance. We made some improvements where our scaling climbs to about 120, then it, it flattens off, but it never decreases, which is a, it can be very detrimental if you want to try and do you know, 100 million cells or plus. Um, the other thing, that, so that's very uh, important for this case is automatic setup of the sliding <coughs> interface. So currently you have to define some zones in, in the standard version and you have to define uh, mesh separate regions separately, you have to bring it all together. It's a, it's a time consuming, laborious process. In our version, you say this zone is a rotating zone and everything else is taken care of by the mesh generator. <coughs> so some of the stuff I mentioned before, here is a, um, uh, a case mesh in open foam. Here we compare a searchable cylinder, which is a primitive shape in, in open foam, and the meshing of the two. Now, a, a primitive shape, you can't extract feature lines for that in a normal way where you put in the surface and you say, okay, this angle, I need a feature angle for that, bring it up. So there's no way currently in open foam to define feature edges other than completely manually or via maybe uh, a third party pre processing tool. So you cannot capture feature edges. You can see there's very rough feature edges here um, because there's no implicit method of defining feature edges. Where our, where our tool can do that without a problem. And this, is, this has got some serious impact for things like um, interfaces, sliding interfaces, or rotating wheels, or fans. We have these interfaces, and you, you want to define them in a simple way, but you can't unless you have those feature lines uh, in OpenFoam now, now version that, that's there, and it's not a problem. 
The other thing that, that we do quite well uh, is feature line, or sorry, layers around sharp corners uh, that uh, still perform in a similar way to the, the case without feature lines. So it's just how, how does this implicit feature, feature snapping work? So instead of saying there's a feature line, let's uh, migrate the nodes or the mesh to the feature line and create the, the feature that way, we say every face next to the boundary, say the wall is here, this red line represents the, the geometry. We take each of these faces and then we rotate and project them as little flat 2D elements towards the wall. So as the, the plate rotates, the points connected to it move as well. And you can see that if you want to um, get this plate connected, this plate and this plate connected to the, to the boundary, you move them there as plates, then you can end up with a very nice representation of that feature angle without a priori definition of the feature angle as such. Um, now, what are the implications for that? The thing is, when you, when you just define a feature angle and you snap, it can cause problems in the mesh. And what Snap the X mesh does when it finds a problem is it scales back. It says, okay, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to capture this feature because it's going to reduce the mesh quality. And then what you end up with is things like this. We have distortions in the mesh that can break the feature edge or they can cause um, unwanted uh, features to appear. If you use the implicit method with the included smoothing, you have no such problems, or very minimal. You can still see there's little dots there, but compared to what we get in standard open foam, it's greatly reduced. Um, then the multi-region support. Here, here we see a, a model of the, the valve system. So we have an inlet and an outlet. I'm not sure which is which, but in the case, then we have the valve over here. Um, and we define the region, the sphere around the valve, intersecting uh, the, the valve stem as a separate um, volume zone. And then the whole apparatus around that that makes it rotate, that defines which, which uh, parts of the surface are actually moving with the rotating frame, they're all done automatically. So you say this volume is, uh, is a rotating sliding interface, and then it goes and, and redefines the patches or reassigns the patches inside the boundary conditions are all done automatically. And we, <coughs> we also so have some improvements to the way in which surface layers, so the layers are defined. So typically, uh, you could define the expansion ratio, the number of layers, and some matching. So a, a few parameters. What we've done is we've extended the number of parameters and allowed the user to choose three. So you can choose the first cell height and absolute value, say one millimeter, two millimeters. You can, you can choose the final cell height. The final cell height, in this case, is the, the size of the cell next to the base mesh. So you define that in, in a relative uh, terms to the absolute, uh, to the base mesh. So if the base mesh is, say, five millimeters side, you can say, I want the final cell height to be 40% or uh, two millimeters uh, relative to the base cell. Then you can define the expansion ratio, of course, the number of layers, total thickness. You take three of these, the other two are calculated automatically during the meshing process. Um, so you can see you can have different, different effects. Here, for example, um, we have the total layer thickness so that from, the, from the wall to where it meets the, um, the base mesh. The first, this one is the final cell height and the, the first cell height. And then the number of layers, the expansion ratio is calculated automatically. Here you've got other, um, you know, other permutations, the number of layers defined here, and here we have the expansion ratio defined as well. So you can control your mesh quality in a, in a variety of ways. Basically, you can get what you need to do your simulation uh, to the degree and the accuracy <coughs> that you want to. So all these things applied um, to the specific case. You can see um, here is our AMI interface. This is the, where the sliding will happen along. This is discontinuity in the mesh. Um, we, we disconnect the two sides completely. They, we we, we may match and merge to the interface as, as well as we can. And you can see here the layers. We start off with a coarse mesh, and we have many layers to get the first cell height that is fixed. As we go to a finer mesh, the number of layers reduces and reduces even further so that the first cell height all along the wall stays the same, irrespective of what the the size of the overlying meshes. Um, we also have small leak closure, so if you've got a not a perfect geometry, uh, the, the tool will automatically detect if you have, say, a half a millimeter gap. It will find that there's a half a millimeter gap and it will not propagate the mesh through there uh, and repair those interfaces. Similarly, if we have very large holes, we can define which side is the, is the good side, for example. So we say, okay, we want flow um, on the right-hand side. If there are big holes, we have an analysis um, built into the mesh generator that will find these holes uh, via a, a conservation equation system um, and then exclude, here you can see the back of a card, it will exclude 
the inside, even though it's connected through this point, you'll find that this point is the narrowest one, it connects the inside to the outside, and it will then exclude all those things. So you've got a lot of automatic repair mechanisms that allows you to put in dirty CAD or very large CAD systems which haven't been uh, gone over by uh, CAD analysts with, with minute uh, tweezers, which makes the whole process a lot more robust and reduces your turnaround time significantly. Then, um, something that's very important for FSI or for specifically for CHT conjugate heat transfer is to have layers on both sides. So if you only have a layer on the, layers on the fluid side or only on the solid side, then you're going to lose the high gradients in, in temperature that you see across the fluid uh, liquid interface. And what we've done is to allow um, these interfaces to be meshed as kind of a baffle, and then we put layers on both sides. And similarly, we can put layers just into a fluid volume. So if you have a, a propeller or a bladed a turbine, you can have these shear, shear layers where you have um, layers in the wake, in the fluid volume, um, around the virtual surface. That's then removed at the end of the meshing process. Another thing that's very useful for pipe systems especially is to be able to use less cells in very elongated pipe sections. So what we did to, to um, uh, improve matters there is that we have a, a way of contracting and expanding uh, the geometry such that we can mesh a contracted region and then ex expand it again so we use many, many less cells than would normally be the case. So here we have a, a heat exchanger bundle tube array. Um, you can see here is what we mesh and then we stretch it out and when you have maybe five to six times fewer cells by stretching than we have just by meshing it with a constant sized cell. And the accuracy is identical because uh, the change in the direction of the tube bundle is very small in the transport of quantities. We don't use this in the current case, but it's obviously a very useful tool when you do these kind of analyses. Then um, looking at, again, at differences between standard here, open foam, the 2.2 version and our version of the mesh generator, we can see that um, layers collapse typically around both concave and, and sharp external corners. And this is for various reasons. In this case, there's a symmetry plane here, and open foam doesn't deal very well with moving the contact point across the symmetry plane. With our version, it's not a problem. I don't know if you can see. Can you see this on the, not very well? No. Okay. There, there are some layers that terminate, so the layers come here and stop. And here, the layers go around the corner without any change in their aspect or their quality. The same thing here with this external angle. Um, we have a, a problem with the open frame snapping to this corner because of the implicit. Um, yeah? Five minutes, okay. So, the problem with the implicit or the explicit snapping in open frame where it, it turns this little, if you can see that little face there around the corner, and that causes uh, quality issues, and then the layers can't grow because of the way in open, which the measure works. In our version, the implicit snapping it finds the best solution to, to put the faces on, and you have the layers around there um, without, any, without any issues. Okay, let's skip this. Um, then, this is a look at the interface for creating the mesh. You, uh, you have automatic block mesh, so you don't make um, a, a base mesh and then start the meshing process stop on top of that. You have an automated method that looks at the, the size of your geometry and puts a block around it, divided up into how many ever cells. Um, then you import your surfaces. Um, your volume regions or your, your rotating regions uh, and finally you mesh it and the, the block mesh is created automatically um, and all the four components just work uh, without any manual editing of the input files. So this is the mesh we used. Our measure was about 50% faster than, than the standard one. Um, with our near wall layers we have one and a bit better coverage. It's very difficult in a smooth shape like this to compare because there are not many difficult points. Only the sharp edges really cause any problems for the layer addition. So in that context, it's still a decent improvement and the total is about 1.7 million cells. <coughs> so the setup is also GUI driven. There's a, you choose your type of simulation, um, you go through the various stages, so you choose incompressible, compressible, um, your, your material properties, boundary conditions are inserted, um, then your cell zone, this is where you define the rate of rotation of, um, of the, the valve, for example. Um, you can define your initial fields. We're still working to improve this currently. It's only a fixed value, but we will have various initialization methods in the future, like potential flow um, and set or so use selectable regions. You define your numerical schemes. Most of these things um, default to best practices that we have predefined. So if you're using RANs, steady state will use linear upwind. Uh, it won't ask you to, to input those kind of things. <coughs> Solver settings and run the controls. Then you press the run button in the GUI, and the thing goes off and does the stuff. 
there's an interface to, to clusters for a remote agent. You can run it on Windows, you can run it on Linux, you can run your um, solver in Linux or in Windows, it doesn't matter. It all, interact, uh, all talks to each other quite uh, well. Um, I've mentioned this, this stuff already, I'm going to skip here to get to the results. Um, just quickly, the setup. Um, what is different from what was done before is that it's a moving mesh, it's completely transient, and we have a Clovis model included. We're doing 20 seconds of simulation, so the valve goes from fully open to fully closed during that time. We have two different cases. Um, one is for a low volume flow rate, where we just have a fixed pressure drop, so as it closes, the flow rate decreases. And the other one's for a fixed flow, uh, this is the worst case scenario, uh, and the pressure lock drop obviously goes up a lot as the valve closes. So this is the one, this is the results uh, for the case where we have a fixed pressure drop. Um, the runtime is about 33 hours and 12 CPUs, it's not quick, but uh, um, I think it can scale much higher. The, the scaling of the, the interface and dynamic motion in foam is quite, quite good, so if you use a decent cluster it will come down to a short amount of time. Um, here you can see the velocity contours uh, on a plane going through the valve and see as the valve closes you have higher velocity and eventually as it, the resistance increases the velocities decrease um, and the valve enters a shut position. So this is a quick plot of um, the, the, the flow rate here. As it closes the flow rate obviously decreases with fixed pressure boundaries and we have the, the forces on the valve as it closes over time. So it's not from zero seconds and then the 20. Um, and you can see there's some instability here in the issue where you have lots of shedding behavior around the valve and then as, as the flow stabilizes in that position you have a smooth uh, decrease in the, the forces as it, as it becomes symmetric, the valve becomes symmetric to the open flow. So the case that we're really interested in is the, is the last one, is the one where we have fixed high, high rate flow. So um, we, we compare the red line here is our continuous closing of the dynamic model uh, and then we have uh, some CFD from Dynaflow down at fixed points um, along the closing process and we have some experimental values. Now the experimental values are all done for a straight pipe and of course when the valve closes it closes, it doesn't uh, have a little edge around it that stays open. That's one uh, drawback of the current sliding interface in open foam is you can't close things off with it. There has to be fluid on both sides of the interface at the front. So something we will be working on and hopefully change in the future. So you, you can see here the, the comparison is not too bad. There's a huge spread in the, in the results for the experiment, so we're inside that spread. And we're quite close to the static results, so we can say that the dynamic effect is negligible on the prior analysis. Everything done before is still, still valid. And any difference here probably is a result of the turbulence modeling um, and the dynamic of there's some dynamic effect, but I think it's quite small. So just to conclude, um, the results agree fairly well. Um, there's no change in the force uh, forces on the on the valve as such. So whatever the prior conclusions were that the, the, the valve opening or closing problems were as a result of some mechanical uh, situation, that's still the case. Um, but more importantly, we, we've used Helix. You know, we're constantly developing this tool. We've used it successfully for a rather complex case. Um, and during the process, it's just clicking buttons. There's no tools to repair the mesh or additional things to, to configure certain parts or bring meshes together. Everything happens. Uh, in a straightforward manner. Uh, also it concludes that the AMI, this dynamic sliding interface, works quite well. There are minimal artifacts at the interface. It's, it's quite smooth, so we're quite happy with the performance of these upgrades in open foam. Um, but we need this partial overlap AMI for closing the system off completely. And just finally I'd like to say that this, this tool we, we're, um, will also be uh, sold by Dynaflow in the future. Helix will be provided uh, to its customers. Um, so we have various avenues of uh, getting hold of it now. Thanks. Thank you very much.